This is the Dell XPS M1210, and it's completely unremarkable. Welcome to Quick Start, a series about fast booting operating systems from the dawn of the modern PC era that were included in millions of computers, utterly ignored and then forgotten entirely for good reasons. Now in the last video, I promised you a look at the most brain-twisting, soul-crushing instant boot operating system ever conceived. This isn't that. Not yet. We gotta get through the sludge before we get to the really good stuff. I didn't actually say it would be the next video, but this episode will be quick. You'll hardly notice it. If you want the whole backstory, you can watch episode one if you want, but you don't need to. All you gotta know is that in the late 2000s, around the time Windows Vista came out, PCs started to boot really slowly. Like we're talking multiple minutes to start up when Windows XP had been booting in 30 or 40 seconds on the same hardware. This was probably caused by the relentless march of technology. We all had spinning hard disks at the time, and Windows Vista was over a gig of data spread across a ton of tiny files, so it just took a long time to load, especially on hardware that wasn't top of the line. The problem got a bit better when Windows 7 came out, and it pretty much went away when we started putting solid state drives and everything, but for a brief period, near the end of the 2000s, PC vendors were panicking and looking for a way to speed up boot times without actually offering better hardware. Since that was impossible, what they did instead was they shipped machines with two operating systems, a normal Windows install and then a second, much smaller OS that could boot more quickly, usually a little tiny Linux distro. So far in this series, we've seen a Sony VAIO that took four whole minutes to boot Windows, but only about 30 seconds to boot its secondary OS, but all it could do was play DVDs, so there wasn't much point. We've also seen Asus ExpressGate, also known as Splashtop, a copy of Linux that could live directly on your motherboard, but that offered almost no software except a web browser. Millions of people vaguely knew they had it, but nobody cared, especially since it only booted a few seconds faster than Windows anyway. So far, as we've dug up this forgotten industry, it has left nothing like a positive impression. The track record of these OSs is garbage, to put it mildly. They just didn't offer enough improvement to be worth the hassle. But there was still room to do worse. We already have enough information to tell that shipping a crappy Linux distro was not the silver bullet to cure the problems of 2007's PC industry. But what about a vendor who decides to just go back to 2006? I know of at least three companies who took the approach I'll be covering today. The one we're gonna put in the doghouse is Dell because I just happen to have their XPS M1210 on hand. I don't have any of the others, and this is such a dumb solution that they aren't worth buying just to show you. The machine itself is actually not half bad. Uh, it's a Core 2 Duo 2.0 uh, with a couple gigs of RAM, and it's from Dell's gaming line, so it's shipped with a GeForce Go 7400, at least if you got the high trim. This ain't that, so it has an Intel GMA 945 to go with the 1280 by 800 LCD. It does at least still have an optical drive though. Those were still pretty universal at the time, but they were starting to delete them from compact machines, and this is only a 12 inch laptop. The perfect size. They shouldn't even make machines bigger than this. So it's nice that they left it in. Overall, this thing feels well built. Uh, it looks pretty nice to the era. The keyboard's pretty solid uh, and the battery, albeit an aftermarket replacement, still holds a charge. So as a collector's item, it's pretty decent. It's a shame it isn't the high-end model. It'd be nice to have a little machine that could run era appropriate 3D video games poorly. But in general, this is a machine you wouldn't have minded owning in its day. Now, a lot of instant on operating systems are very easy to miss completely. Most people didn't even realize they had them on their computers. This machine, however, actually makes it very clear. See, next to the normal power button, there's a second power button labeled Media Direct, and that's the name of the operating system we'll be looking at today. You might actually remember having this button if you had a Dell laptop, because they shipped it on a ton of machines across several market segments. And in fact, a bunch of people have told me that they did notice it, but that they never even bothered pressing it to see what it was, and that doesn't surprise me in the least. As I've said before, all these instant-on operating systems are basically invisible to nerds. Even if we vaguely knew they were there, we assumed they'd be useless and didn't bother investigating. And we were right, they were useless. This series largely exists to vindicate our assumptions, but this one is even more useless than most. I started this series, and indeed this episode, with the claim that computers booted really slowly in 2007 and that Windows Vista was to blame. Well, this machine breaks those rules in several ways. It's actually from 2006, it didn't come with Vista, and it doesn't boot slowly. 
Per this review of the M1210 from its original release, it came with Windows XP and it had one of those little stickers that says Vista Ready on the bottom. This machine, on the other hand, clearly shipped in 2007 because it has the Vista sticker on it. Still, Dell was definitely selling this exact machine with this exact hardware in 2006 running Windows XP. And I guarantee, God damn to you, that loaded in a hot jiffy, probably 30 seconds or less. So that puts this machine completely out of the running for our narrative. And even when they started selling it with Vista, it didn't really change anything. This machine is running Vista. I installed it from the Dell Restore Media. It's using Service Pack 1. And from power on to a desktop, it only takes about 40 seconds. If you want to be generous and wait for the Windows sidebar to load, that sometimes gets us up to 50 seconds, but under a minute is just about as good as it got on any PC in these days. Say those days. Now these is valid. When you're speaking in context, that's valid. These is in the days that I'm holding. PETA, I'll do it again though. Under a minute is just about as good as it got on any PC in those days. And this is even on a contemporary 5400 RPM spinning disc. I didn't swap it out for an SSD or anything. So we haven't even gotten to the instant on OS for this episode and we're already doubting its usefulness. Did this machine ever have a slow boot problem? Personally, I don't think so, but let's consider all the factors. I asserted in the first episode that most of the slow boot problem wasn't really the hardware or the operating system. Spinning disks and inefficient Microsoft code may have counted for something, but most of the issue was probably the malware that PC vendors heaped onto their systems. All that crap like McAfee and Weatherbug. And this machine, for what it's worth, has none of that installed. Now, I literally got this out of the garbage. It had no hard drive. That's why there's just a gaping hole in the side where the tray is supposed to be. I had to wedge some tape in there to hold the disc in. So I had to reload this machine from scratch, obviously. And maybe that's the rub. Maybe I didn't get everything this came with. Maybe Dell shipped it with a bunch of dumb crap installed and that was slowing down startup. But I don't think so because Dell was never as aggressively stupid about bundling shitware as any of the other vendors. They're just not as petty. I used to work in PC recycling. I saw thousands of Dells contemporary with this thing, a lot of them with the original software, and I don't recall them ever being gummed up with the same kind of crap you'd see on a Toshiba or an HP. And I restored tons of Dell machines from original recovery media, and unlike almost every other vendor, Dell's recovery disks are just stock Windows installs with a few slipstreamed drivers and not much else. Even if you run the utility and driver disks, it still doesn't pile on any of the usual crap. It's just a Synaptics touchpad driver and the Dell service center. I think that Dell just shipped really clean OS loadouts and we're probably seeing pretty much what the original experience was like. So right from the jump, we have to ask why we're even here. What is this machine doing in this series? Why would this even need an instant on feature? Frankly, I don't have an answer. We'd have to ask Dell because that is how this was marketed. A Nantex review of the Inspiron 1705 at CES 2006, for instance, which had the same feature, said that the Media Direct interface is designed to minimize the amount of time needed to get your notebook up and running. So, Media Direct is definitely part of the Instant On story. Why? Uh, does it boot really phenomenally fast or does it offer unique features? What's the deal here? Well, let's find out. If we press that media direct button, it actually lights up a separate power light. How do you like that? All right, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, that's booted in under 15 seconds. Pretty impressive, but let's hold our applause. If you're thinking, wow, that looks exactly like Windows Media Center, I have some thoughts about that which we'll come back to, but let's explore before we speculate. Not that there's that much to explore. We are offered options for movies, videos, music, pictures, instant office, update, help, and settings. These all do exactly what you think and I'm not gonna waste your one life doing a pixel by pixel tour. Movies is a DVD player. That's all it is. Let's uh, put it in a disc. Somebody commented on the VIO video where I said that the, uh, the CD-ROM door was really flimsy by saying like, I think you're supposed to support those when you press on them. I don't disagree. However, look at this one. See, it's like pretty robust. Yeah, you probably should support it, but if you're pressing here, that guy doesn't really flex. 
that one really was exceptionally flimsy. Anyway, here it is, a DVD player. It's exactly like every other DVD player you've ever seen. The one difference between this and just playing a DVD under Windows is that for some reason, none of the keyboard controls work. Uh, you may have noticed that on the front of this machine, there's an incredibly worn down row of media playback controls. Uh, we've got uh, play, pause, back, forward, and stop, as well as volume controls. And you have to use those in DVD playback mode, which really sucks because pressing these thin ass hinged plastic buttons is a lot harder than just smacking spacebar. So that's awkward, but in every other sense, this is no different than any other DVD player you've ever seen, hardware or software. In fact, if we go back to the main menu, we can see that it says powered by Cyberlink. That company is well known for developing Power DVD, one of the two software packages that came with every single DVD drive ever sold. Uh, in fact, the other one, WinDVD, was developed by InnerVideo, who provided the instant on environment for the Sony VAIO in the first episode. So we can see how this works. So this is quite literally the software you were using if you were watching DVDs on your computer. Next up, we have videos. That plays videos. This can handle AVIs, MPEGs, WMVs, and uh, if we go back here, we can actually browse for videos on the local hard drive. We can jump straight to my documents or uh, to a shared videos folder in the uh, like public user directory, or we can just dig through the hard drive and look anywhere we like. Uh, it also supports any USB or other storage devices. This machine has an SD card reader in the side, so you could probably use that. Uh, and of course, the media playback controls work when you're playing videos. The most interesting thing about this actually, if we go in, open a video, and then exit back to the menu, it continues playing in a little thumbnail down here, uh, even if you leave and go to another area. So if we go back, we'll go to the next section here. We'll go to pictures. Uh, this is, of course, a picture viewer. Uh, this has all the features you'd expect from a picture viewer. For instance, we can view a picture. Uh, it can look in the local hard drive or attach storage, just like before, and it can do slideshows. Uh, here we go, next picture, next picture, next picture. And again, it doesn't accept keyboard input for some reason. Yep, nothing. You have to use the media controls on the front. It's super awkward, why, why, why do this? But anyway, when we exit the slideshow, hey, there we go, our video is still playing and it continues until you hit the stop button. I feel like picture in picture is an unusual feature for a media library app of this era. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I like it. Moving on, the music section also offers absolutely no surprises. Uh, it lets you browse for music in the same places. You can actually import stuff to build a music library. It'll search your hard drive, that sort of thing. And then of course we can play a song. And as before, uh, if you go to another section, this will continue in the thumbnail down here. But one thing is kind of a bummer. If we go in to play a song, we can actually go over and visualize it. And I'm not sure where it gets these visualizations from. <laughs> They're pretty crappy. And it just cycles through them randomly each time you select the feature. But those won't play in the thumbnail view, which probably makes sense, but I still think it's kind of a bummer. Anyway, the final section here is Instant Office, uh, which is almost interesting, but not quite. It offers three features, contacts, calendar, and presentations, and boy howdy, do they ever do what you think they do. If you have either Outlook Express or Outlook installed, uh, you can create contacts and calendar entries in it, and MediaDirect will inject a plugin that periodically scrapes those and copies their contents into the Instant On environment, so you can view them from here without needing to boot up Windows and launch the actual app. So. Here's a contact. Here's an event on my calendar. There you go, that's what it does. You can't add or edit anything, it views. The presentations feature is a PowerPoint slide deck viewer. You can pick a deck and it opens it in the official Microsoft PowerPoint viewer app and displays it full screen. There you go. It's nothing really much more to say about this and 
That's pretty much it. Uh, other than help, which is help, you've seen the whole thing. Uh, in fact, even the update and the settings options just tell you to go into Windows and use the companion app there. So, that was pretty dull. It's just a weird knockoff of Windows Media Center that doesn't even really deserve a video. So the interesting part must be the implementation, right? This is gonna be some crappy Linux distro living in a hidden disk partition or a, a file or whatever. That's how the last two episodes turned out and it's how most of the others in this series will. So let's just get onto it. Let's see how they stuffed Linux into the laptop. Whoops. Yeah, Dell's solution to Vista being slow was to ship XP. This is literally just Windows XP. It's so minimally modified that they didn't even bother killing the three finger salute. So we can just go to run here. We can start Explorer and go over to about, hey, there it is, XP embedded. Uh, now that's exactly the same as normal Windows XP, just Microsoft licenses it differently and it's easy for vendors to yank out chunks of the operating system to cut down on disk and memory footprint. Embedded is usually sold for like cash registers, drive through order screens, stuff like that, but it really is just normal Windows with some stuff removed. See, if we go to Explorer, just go to my computer, there's the two disk partitions, the D drive, is where Vista's installed, that's got all our normal user data. But if we go to the C drive, which is normally not visible, that's a little two gig partition, and here's Windows XP. You can tell because it's got documents and settings instead of uh, users. And if we just dig into program files, go to Dell, MediaDirect, hey, there's all the files for MediaDirect. So this is just a program running under ordinary Windows. It's so ordinary, in fact, that we didn't even need to trick it into admitting what it is. If I had simply pressed the power button again, it literally says Microsoft Windows and has the XP logo during shutdown. This thing is just bereft of mystery. It is incredibly straightforward, except for a few little oddities. For instance, if you were around for this era, you might be wondering just why that logo even appeared. Normally when you shut down XP, it doesn't show a blank screen with a logo and a progress bar. That's odd, right? Well, that's because it isn't shutting down. XP did boot faster than Vista, but not that much faster. It still would have taken 30 or 40 seconds, best case. So Dell or Cyberlink, whoever developed this thing, went a step further and set it up so that instead of shutting down, it actually hibernates. That saves the contents of memory to disk, which cuts down considerably on boot time. Uh, we can see this if we uh, pull the battery out while MediaDirect is running. So let's do that. All right, you can see this picked up right where we left off, but uh, just to make the point, let's turn this bad boy over and pull the power. All right, that's off. So it didn't have an opportunity to make a hyper file. So when we boot up again, it's gonna have to cold start. Let's plug everything back in. All right, we'll hit media direct again. Uh, you can barely see it because the screen's dim, but that is the normal Windows XP loading throbber. So they made a custom splash screen, but it's definitely still XP. And if we time this, it takes nearly a minute to reach the desktop. It's actually slower than Vista somehow. So hibernation really is making a huge difference here. This was a pretty new technique in the XP era, uh, which is why you might not have recognized the hibernate screen, but trust me, it looks exactly the same as it did in vanilla XP, except the screen normally says that it's hibernating. The developers of this thing took the most minimal steps to obscure their sleight of hand here. They replaced the XP boot splash and the hibernation resume screen, and apparently they decided to modify a string somewhere to say exiting instead of hibernating. But that's it. They didn't manage to remove the XP logo completely or take any actions to lock down the OS, and I'm not really sure why since disabling control delete, for instance, was extremely common on public kiosks. And for that matter, I'm not even sure why they cared about obscuring the fact that it's hibernating. Who cares? The technical people wouldn't have been fooled and the non-technical people wouldn't have known what it meant. And that's really Dell Media Direct in a nutshell. It's inexplicable in every regard. I'm baffled by it. I don't see why it's designed the way it is. And more importantly, I just can't really see a reason for it to exist. A few minutes ago, I posed the question, why would this machine need an instant on OS at all? And now, having reviewed it in full, I still have no answer. This thing is pretty high spec for the era. We can trust that it never had issues with boot time. I admit a 30 second improvement is 
technically an improvement, but you hardly notice it. Even being used to modern PCs and smartphones, you just don't really notice 30 seconds. It's not enough time for your mind to wander. But even if we want to believe that Dell felt a 30 second difference was worth all this hassle, the solution they went with renders itself redundant because it relies on hibernation. Now, I've asserted before that sleep and hibernate were not super reliable on PCs in this era. If they were, then this whole fast boot phenomenon never would have happened. Vendors would have just said, put your PC in hibernate instead of shutting it down. Done, finished, go home. The whole reason they shipped these silly little quick boot OSs is that sleep wasn't reliable. But however pointless most of those were, and believe me, before this series is over, you'll agree they were pretty much all pointless. This is even more pointless because it does the thing they were trying to avoid. They're hibernating XP. Why not just hibernate Vista? Here, let's try that. All right, well, I wanted to demo that, but the backlight on this display just died right here in the middle of the shoot. It's almost like this thing's nearly 20 years old or something. Anyway, let me drag out a monitor. All right, there we go. Let's go ahead now and hibernate. All right, the machine's off. Let's start it back up. One, two, three, 16, 17. All right, and if we want to get to a desktop, that's maybe 20, 22 seconds. So this whole XP nonsense was pointless in service of three, four seconds of improvement, if anything. What was Dell's justification for all this effort? Were they just really intent on selling these machines as multimedia systems with a seamless appliance-like experience? Well, maybe, but they didn't need to do any of this crap to accomplish that, because you could get the exact same experience in the normal OS. See, if we're in Vista, and we just press the Media Direct button, hey, look at that. It's Media Direct. It's the same program. It's literally the exact same piece of software. It runs in full screen, the UI is identical, the media buttons on the front work. What possible benefit was there to running this in XP instead of Vista? I'm grasping at straws at this point, but could it have been to save power? This theory came up before. Uh, Sony's Vio TX series laptop that I covered in the first episode could boot up into a copy of Linux that had nothing except a dedicated DVD player app, and I couldn't figure out why you'd ever do that when you could just play DVDs in Windows. I wondered if maybe it offered better battery life, but I wasn't able to test that. And while I found a review that actually said battery life was slightly worse in instant on mode, that was actually for a different model. So maybe there really was an economy advantage, but I doubt it. That review was for another contemporary Vio, and the software was identical, so I think the experience would have been identical as well. Vista was probably better optimized than most people give it credit for. Most of what runs your battery down when you're playing video is playing the video, so changing operating systems isn't really going to make a meaningful difference. But this time around, I decided to try to prove this, and my testing seems to produce the same results. I don't have the patience to do a rigorous benchmark, of course, so here's the janky shit I did instead. I pulled the battery, hooked the power brick up through a watt meter, and measured the power while idling at a desktop, while playing audio, and while playing a DVD, all using the same MediaDirect app in both OSs. And I found that at idle, the machine pulls about 17 to 18 watts. When playing audio, it's about 19 to 22. And when playing video or DVDs, it's between 25 and 30, with nearly identical results in both OSs. Uh, switching power supplies can be a bit weird to measure. There could be spikes that are missing or capacitive effects throwing things off, but frankly, no. I don't think any of that matters. I think it's just that the difference between a clean Vista install and an XP install running the exact same software on a system otherwise optimized for mobile is very slim, and nobody should really be surprised by that. So this feature isn't justified by lower power consumption, by user experience, or really even by faster boot times. So What's left? In fact, let's go deeper. Why does this Media Center app even exist? If you look at it next to Windows Media Center, to say it's inspired is an understatement. It's clearly meant to be a nearly pixel perfect clone. Why was Dell shipping a nearly plagiarized version of Windows Media Center instead of the real thing? Well, for once, I think that this isn't that much of a mystery, and it comes down to Microsoft's asinine market segmentation. Windows Vista, famously, had a ton of SKUs that baffled the hell out of consumers. Starter, Home Basic, Home Premium, Business, and Ultimate. 
Of those, only two came with Media Center, Home Premium and Ultimate. The M1210 shipped with Vista Business, and that made sense. If an actual business bought it, they wanted business features, which you couldn't get in Home Premium. Dell, however, wanted salespeople to be able to play videos and slideshows during presentations, so they wanted to provide the Media Center features, but shipping Vista Ultimate on a business laptop was absurd, so they went with the most reasonable solution. They shipped Vista Business and then bought a clone of Windows Media Center from a third party to add on top of it. And this was the most reasonable solution because Microsoft, for no conceivable reason, would not sell that program on its own. Windows Media Center is just a program. It's an EXE. There's no reason they couldn't have taken 20 bucks per machine and let Dell add it. But they wanted their ridiculous market segmentation, so Dell got forced into this stupid solution. And they were doing it on this machine, even when it was shipping with XP, because the problem was even worse in that era. Media Center was its own completely separate edition of XP, only available to OEMs. And again, Microsoft offered no solution to add it to XP Pro. So in 2006, if you wanted to accept remote desktop connections, join a domain, and have Media Center, Microsoft would tell you to go piss up a rope instead of taking your money. But by the time this was all done, how could it still have been profitable? They were shipping a full fat Windows license, plus an embedded license, plus a third party app. If all that was still cheaper than Vista Ultimate, then Microsoft must have been charging outright criminal license fees. Although I can believe that. So the existence of the Cyberlink Media Center clone makes some sense, maybe possibly, but the dual boot XP situation still doesn't. And I really only have one theory for its existence. Media Direct wasn't for this machine. The Inspiron 1705 that Anantech was looking at at CES 2006 didn't have a Core 2 Duo. It had a Core Duo, a considerably inferior chip. It was also going to be available optionally with a Core Solo, which is almost like running Vista on a Pentium 3. I'm willing to believe that those machines took long enough to boot to justify this crap. If you could still get to Media Direct in 15 or 20 seconds, then yeah, that probably did count for something. And if Dell was anything like Asus, then instead of just adding this feature to machines where it was warranted, they probably issued standing orders to put it on every machine in their lineup that fit certain parameters, resulting in bizarre, pointless products. And they weren't alone. At least two other companies did the exact same thing, probably for similar reasons. Samsung shipped a bunch of systems in their Q series with something called AV Now or AV Station, which is so obscure that Google mostly just returns misspellings, but I was able to find an screenshot and it appears to be another Media Center clone. I also found an image of the recovery CD and it's definitely Windows based. HP also shipped a number of machines, including the DV6000 with HP Quick Play. Same deal, there's almost no information about it online other than passing mentions in reviews and videos of such low resolution that you literally cannot see what's going on. But the few clear screenshots we can find suggest that, again, it's a Media Center clone. And I can't really find the recovery media, but Wikipedia claims that at least one version of this was also Windows-based. I have no doubt those solutions were pretty much identical to the one that we just saw, which is why I didn't bother getting any of those machines to demo. Uh, the Samsungs are really hard to find, and reportedly the HP machines with Quick Play mostly destroyed themselves probably due to bad thermal design, as was the style of the time. And this all really fits together because we're talking about a feature that I think was basically meant to make sludge grade computers slightly more tolerable. I'm a little curious if it actually did that, but I feel like the fact that you can't find any info about any of these online suggests it didn't make much of a splash. Top. And that's it for episode four of Quick Start. I hope you didn't set aside an afternoon for that, but I still hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider subscribing to my channel and maybe turn on notifications so you'll find out when the next episode comes out. That one will be about the most absurd, most cursed instant on solution I've ever seen, so you won't want to miss it. And if you really like this series, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here. I couldn't afford to buy these machines or the studio to show you in or gas for my car for that matter without the support of viewers like you. I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's making this possible. Thank you all so much and to everyone else. Thanks for watching.